good afternoon uh, and, and welcome to today's event to discuss and celebrate the launch of the Commission's Getting to Fair Draft Strategy. Uh, some of you will know me. My name is Kate Simons and I'm the Chairperson of the Essential Services Commission. Uh, to start, I would like to make an acknowledgement of country. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land I'm hosting this forum on. For me, that is the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. I also acknowledge the traditional owners of the various lands you are on today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples participating today. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and the elders from other communities who may be here today. Uh, just some quick housekeeping before we get to our discussion on the draft strategy. Uh, we are recording today's forum for sharing online. You will receive an email with a link to the video in the next coming days. Uh, the latter part of today will include a panel discussion with some of our key speakers. Uh, if you have any questions throughout today's discussion, please put them in the Zoom chat function at the bottom of the screen uh, and we will endeavour to respond to them. Otherwise, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. Uh, you'll find this in the bar along the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, we will try to get around to as many questions as we can during today, but if we don't get to yours, uh, we will try to respond uh, via our wrap up email from the team after today. So today's a, a very exciting event for us to celebrate and discuss our draft strategy getting to fair, and it's the accumulation of more than a year's work. Uh, I'd like to first introduce our guest speakers and panelists who have generously given their time to join us today. Uh, as I go around our virtual room, could you, um, I think everyone's got their camera on, so that's great, uh, perhaps just give us a wave. Uh, welcome Cynthia Gabert, uh, Victoria's Energy and Water Ombudsman. Hi, Cynthia. Uh, Jared Brody, um, Chief Executive Officer of the Consumer Action Law Centre. Hi, Jared. Uh, Sarah McNamara, Chief Executive of the Australian Energy Council. Hi, Sarah. Uh, and Pat McCafferty, Managing Director of Yarra, Yarra Valley Water. Hi, Pat. Uh, we also have with us today my fellow Commissioner Simon Corden, uh, who's the Strategies Sponsoring Commissioner, and will be facilitating our panel discussion this afternoon. Uh, I'm also joined by my fellow Commissioners Satesh Bajani, and Rebecca Billings might be somewhere in the background as well. Hi, Rebecca. Um, our CEO, John Hamill, is here with us too, as our members of the Commission's executive and staff. So, so welcome, everyone. I'd also like to acknowledge everyone participating today. We've had over 200 people register for this forum, uh, which is a really amazing response. Uh, and today we have representatives from, just to give you a flavour of who's around the, the virtual table, uh, the Energy and Water Ombudsmen of Victoria and Queensland, uh, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, uh, the Australian Energy Regulator, Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning, Department of Health and Human Services, uh, members of the community health sector, including Vincent Care, Salvation Army, Justice Connect, Anglicare, Uniting Care, uh, re representatives from the telecommunications and banking sectors, and also representatives from energy and water businesses. Really fantastic to see so many people interested in this work and being part of today's discussion. Well, as mentioned, uh, last week's release and today's event is the accumulation of more than 12 months of work. Uh, the Commission has always had a long standing commitment to addressing the access barriers to essential services. We've been proactive in this area for quite a number of years, most notably through the payment difficulty framework in the energy sector and assistance for consumers affected by family violence. But at the end of 2019, we did identify the need for greater consistency and a more comprehensive approach to this work, uh, specifically that developing a strategy to, to address vulnerability was a priority for us and in need of further examination. As we know, the pandemic, along with the bushfires of late 19, early 20, gave our work focus and a clear sense of urgency, but they also elevated the impact we can have on all Victorian consumers and highlighted the role that we have to help break down the barriers to essential services. Uh, some of you would have been at our launch of this week in uh, this work in September last year with a period of research and engagement to deeply understand the experience of vulnerability across all of our regulated sectors. In seeking to identify the nature and the extent of the problem, we deliberately went out to community to access stakeholders we've not been able to reach previously. And this included a deliberative community panel where 37 Victorians gave their time to share their thoughts and reflections on our work. Uh, we also had a stakeholder reference group that we opened to expression of interest and which attracted representative organisations 
we had not frequently engaged with. And there was also research from the University of Melbourne Social Equity Institute on universal and inclusive engagement. Uh, we also continued to hold discussions and collect information on emerging issues through industry workshops, in particular with the energy sector and the water sector, and that included a, a cross-sector workshop to discuss con consumer vulnerability. And I remember very um, clearly an in-depth discussion on utility relief grants. Uh, we had community sector roundtables as well, interviews with community workers and financial counsellors, and data reports from the energy and water sectors. Throughout that time, we also continued to hold discussions with uh, our fellow regulators, in particular the Australian Energy Regulator and other government body, bodies, recognising that we are not going to solve this problem alone. We then took time to ensure everyone within our organisation at the Commission had a common understanding of the problems we're seeking to address. And our organisational leaders tested and challenged what we're hearing and how it fitted into our regulatory and administrative functions. Uh, staff explored how, how they could contribute to improving outcomes for consumers across the breadth of their work program. And what we found was that there was a huge appetite for this work across the Commission and that while we can agree on the problems we need to solve, there are lots of possible ways to address these problems and we don't expect to solve these on our own or in a silo. So at today's launch, uh, we are entering this next phase in identifying those solutions uh, and what those preferred approaches might be to addressing consumer vulnerability. So while we welcome your input on all aspects of the draft strategy, we're particularly keen to hear your feedback on the proposed initiatives and measures, whether we've picked the ones that are going to have an impact uh, and be practical to implement. And we want this next phase to be one of testing and challenging those initiatives and exploring other ways that might likewise respond to the problems we've identified. So we really want to hear from you. And in, in, in developing those possible initiatives and measures you do see in the draft strategy we released, we have tried to strike a balance that honours what we've heard through our research engagement. Uh, and if you've read through the community panel report, you will see a very strong desire for very detailed actions. And at the same time, we understand that we can't be overly prescriptive. These are really co complex problems. They need extensive engagement to achieve good outcomes. We expect many of these matters will require extensive collaboration between community, industry and branches of government that takes place over time. So at its core, uh, getting to FAIR introduces a set of goals for the Commission's work that we hope will improve access to essential services for consumers experiencing vulnerability. It will give us a pathway for consistent, coordinated and long-term approaches to addressing access barriers across all of our regulatory functions. And as I said in the written introduction of the draft strategy, this work sits very close to my heart. It is, it is work that I see changing, not just what we do, but how we do it. It will benefit all Victorians. I'm exceptionally proud of how far we've come and I'm looking forward to seeing the next phase of this work. So as we move into the next stage in the project, we want to invite more voices into the conversation. I'd like to emphasise this is a draft strategy. We want to hear your ideas on the work, its recommendations and priorities so we can refine and move on to a final strategy. We're wanting to develop this strategy in consultation with you and we're particularly keen to hear from our industry stakeholders. We will be having industry specific workshops over the next month. Uh, and are open to feedback submitted via Engage Victoria, emails or calls, so please reach out. Okay, I think I'd now like to invite uh, Cynthia, uh, Victoria's Energy and Water Ombudsman, Cynthia Gabert, to speak on our draft strategy uh, and to share your thoughts, Cynthia, on how this work will interact with the Ombudsman's office and your work. So I'll hand over to you to uh, address um, us today. Thanks very much, Cynthia. Uh, thank you, Kate. Um, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on which we're all located today and recognise their uh, ongoing connection to land, water and culture. I'd specifically like to pay my respects to um, Elders past, present and emerging and any that are joining us today. Um, first off, I, I would like to commend the ESC team for the effort with which they've tackled this task. It's no small task um, and it's almost a framing of the challenges that all of us are wrestling with every day in our jobs. 
So the thing that I'm particularly appreciative of is the focus on the essentiality of the services that we're talking about and the importance of the consumer voice in any discussion about essential services. I know I've sat in rooms with many of you that are on the call today and we've talked at length about consumers, but the consumer hasn't been in the room. So I commend um, the Commission for, for the work that they've done there. Um, as the Energy and Water Ombudsman, we, uh, my office is keenly focused both on resolving individual complaints for consumers about essential services, but also on working to reduce the occurrence of complaints, in effect putting up those safety barriers rather than being the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. And we recognise that it's not straightforward to do that preventative work, um, but it's actually something that requires us to engage effectively together on the complexity of it. Um, the thing for us, I suppose, that jumps out of this piece of work that the Commission has done is the emphasis on the human and actually the people who, who are accessing our services, who are accessing the services of all of those on the call today, um, and importantly, recognising that it isn't about um, one particular issue that, that creates barriers to participation, but the events-based element of a barrier, systemic based and market based, I think is a really important framing of um, the challenges that consumers experience and shifts it away from attributing responsibility for onto customers to actually being about the system in which they're operating. So while on the one hand, bringing the human voice into the strategy is important, it's not about attributing responsibility onto the human for why um, things are going wrong. That is especially important from our perspective because we are talking, as I said before, about essential services. These aren't nice to have purchases. These are uh, essential to the way that we operate into society and a focus on improving how we're able to access these is really important. I think the goals and themes that came through in the draft report are a fair representation of what we're seeing in our work. Um, I think Kate touched on the challenge though of operationalising these and that's I suppose, where the rubber's really going to hit the road. How do you take you know, eight big ideas and make them into um, strategy, imp implementable strategies, actionable strategies that are going to make a meaningful difference to how people are able to engage in the essential services market? Um, there's an enormous breadth of initiatives that have been proposed. And I suppose being a bit of devil's advocate, I do wonder whether we're going to be able to achieve all of those lofty goals. Um, and I'll just give you an example of where um, I see that we may, may run into some speed bumps, we'll call them. Um, if I think, for example, about the payment difficulty framework, uh, our experience of that is that there is both inconsistency across retailers and inconsistency within retailers. And I think our Missing the Mark report that we released late last year um, gives you a sense of that. So um, it's great to see that the Commission will be reviewing the payment difficulty framework and really the customer experience of the payment difficulty framework. Um, one of the questions I suppose that strikes me is how then do we turn it into that right balance of prescription versus principle-based approaches? How does that then deliver that increase in trust, which I think is one of the goals that, that the Commission's chasing, when from our experience, many of the challenges um, aren't the regulations per se, but how they come to life, how the regulatory team can translate them into something that the frontline staff can implement in a way that engages effectively with a human on the other end of the call. Um, I think, you know, that review and uh, change will put particular challenges up for the Commission if we've got a three year period of time in which to ch achieve all of this. Um, I think your monitoring team may be going a little bit around in circles trying to, to, to lift that standard, but I think it's an excellent goal. I think there's some really good understanding of the issues. I'm just, um, I, I recognise you've got some big challenges in actually operationalising it, but nevertheless, I think it's, it's um, incumbent on all of us to actually be stepping into that space and working with the Commission to make this have a meaningful impact for, for end consumers. Um, I have plenty of other challenges I want to throw out, but I'm, maybe, maybe I shouldn't be doing it too early and stirring up things too much. But I think the thing that for EWOV and hopefully for everybody who's on this call is this is a draft strategy that is able, that the ESC is really seeking our engagement on. This isn't going to be fixed. None of the issues that are presented um, in the draft strategy are going to be fixed by a regulator operating in isolation from 
all of us that are on the call today. So we will be actively engaging in the process. Um, the end goal is an outstanding end goal and I think it will only make an impact if we're all to fill our space and actually engage effectively in this process to deliver something that makes a difference to the consumers of essential services. So I might leave it there, Kate, um, before I stir up too many, too many what ifs and maybes. Yeah, well, thank you, Cynthia. Always welcome to stir. I think sometimes that's where the, uh, the, the best robust discussion and better outcomes come from. So I appreciate you throwing some out of the pot and into the, into the fire for us to have a think about and, and look forward to continuing discussions on that. Look, I think um, you've, uh, you've highlighted a couple of things there that absolutely are front of mind for us. So working with um, you and, and EWOV is a key relationship that will keep um, keep helping us to deliver the benefits of the strategy. Absolutely, it's an enormous breadth of challenge before us, but I think we need to grasp that with both hands and take that forward as best we can together and not, not in isolation, as you say. So I think um, excellent to hear some of the key initiatives you feel we should focus on, which is the payment difficulty framework and energy and making those I guess those customer outcomes really come alive through working with the sector, with you uh, and with other regulators. So uh, look forward to working with you, Cynthia, and absolutely happy to have a chat uh, in the coming uh, weeks and months about um, that those operational um, issues that might come from some of the breadth of the, the goals and themes that we've set forth. So I uh, appreciate that, Cynthia, and um, thanks very much for being here today. Uh, Simon, I think um, I'm now going to hand over to you who, and you're going to be introducing each of our speakers uh, for some presentations and a, and a panel discussion. So I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much, Simon. Look, thanks, Kate. And thank you to, again to everyone for attending today. Before we get to the exciting panel, I uh, just want to echo Kate's in acknowledging the traditional owners of land um, I'm working on in the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. I also acknowledge traditional owners of the various lands that you are working on and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples participating today. I pay my respects to elders past, present, emerging and elders from other communities who may be here today. So as the commissioner responsible for shepherding this work, uh, with uh, I'm thrilled to be at this stage of the process. As Kate said, uh, we do want to hear your, we're really critical to hear your feedback. While many of our draft initiatives um, contain 90% of the final piece, when we when we put out a draft decision, um, this strategy is different. Um, these are our preliminary, our possible initiatives, and we're keen if you think that some of them need to be refined, if you think some of them will add little value, or if you think some of them, um, there's initiatives that we should be proposing, should be doing that we haven't included, we're really keen to want to know. Uh, know that from you. This is the first time in Australia a regulator has uh, presented a strategy like this. Um, we know other regulators are looking at this and working on this. I know the AER in particular is doing a lot of work in this area and will be putting its own strategy out uh, later this year. Um, but we want to, and we want to make sure that we get this right as part of listening to you and uh, developing something that can truly benefit all Victorians. Uh, this work is pretty exciting, I think. In fact, we've got you know over 200 people registered today as a testament of the interest um, that it invokes. And it's great to see such a cross section of members of our community from across Victoria and indeed interstate getting involved, not just in our work, but improving the lives of their fellow Victorians and um, people from elsewhere in Australia. I know uh, many of you will already have reviewed the draft strategy, but I'd just like to take this opportunity to quickly go over some of the key points in the strategy itself. So um, as Kate mentioned, our work was, we should have the slide up, yep, that's, oops. Uh, slides up now, just a sec. What's happening here? So I'm having a problem with my, where is it? Apologies, I'm just having a problem when the slides come up, I've lost my notes. So the strategy involved um, a series, a strong engagement program. Uh, can you just give me a moment? Sorry, I'm having a problem here. There it is. Um, as Kate mentioned, our work was very much uh, focused on understanding the consumer experience, um, including the engagement process with some stakeholders with, that we don't typically have an opportunity to reach out to. From this engagement process, we took inputs from each to develop an understanding of the problems we're seeking to solve. 
core themes we heard uh, relate to communications, engagement, support, and trust. From those, uh, from these problems, we've identified goals, and we're now seeking to identify initiatives which will help us operationalise those goals. We've identified these as possible initiatives and are generally interested in your insights as to their likely impact and feasibility. We, um, I think it's great to get Cynthia's uh, caution on that and that, that we need to recognise the true challenges here. We need uh, your involvement in understanding and uh, to help identify the right set of activities uh, for the Commission to be prioritising, reflecting the fact that there are, uh, we've got limited resources, but so have you in the community sector and in the business sector as well. So we've been wrestling as we develop this strategy, how to be specific to uh, with those initiatives and measures. If you've read the community panel report, you will have seen they had a very strong desire for us to commit to a whole series of very detailed actions. Um, and we've been uh, somewhat less uh, defined in the actions that we're specifying in the draft strategy, because we wanna work with uh, you, the community sector and the business, uh, the industries to, as we move to the next phase. So we're trying to find a balance between providing some structure for your involvement. We're keen to open this up to both business, uh, industry and community so we can help find solutions together. You'll see from the timeline that uh, the team is just sharing that where we are. So all the work that's been done to now has fed into this strategy document. And as Kate has said, now that we've released the draft strategy, we're entering the consultation period before we finalise the strategy. But we've repeatedly heard through this process that we need to think carefully at how we define vulnerability itself. And that term vulnerability is in itself incredibly loaded. So the team's just sharing the slide with the definition that we've created to help structure our work, that a person experiencing vulnerability is someone experiences barriers to participating in the essential services we regulate or administer. And as a result of those barriers, that person experiences economic and social exclusion or harm. Uh, we had some feedback from the community panel that that doesn't need to be economic and social exclusion. It could actually be economic or social exclusion. So we'll look at uh, how we refine that definition. But this definition allows us to acknowledge the experience of vulnerabilities, not just about barriers that someone might face, rather, it's about barriers they might face rather than any potential trait about them themselves. In general, we'll be trying to use in our um, community customer facing consumer uh, material in the future, terms like resilience, well-being, equity, accessibility, inclusion, and fairness, instead of vulnerability with its loaded uh, nature of that term. Uh, so just like to reflect this strategy to date, it's been an incredible piece of work and the initiatives themselves that we finally land on will be vital for its success. Um, so uh, that's a sort of overview of, the, of where we've got to. Um, hopefully uh, you've had a chance to download the actual strategy itself or um, will over the coming uh, week, um, but we're really keen to hear your feedback on it. So now I'm gonna hand over to the panel. Uh, our first panel member is uh, Pat, McCathy, 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 um, who's the managing director at Yarra Valley Water. Um, we're really interested uh, to hear his reflections. Um, Pat's worked in the water industry for more than 20 years. He's also been chair of the Thriving Communities Partnership and advisory member of the Brotherhood of St. Lawrence Energy Assistance Program. And under his leadership, Yarra Valley Water has become one of the industry key industry players in developing initiatives to support those who may experiencing vulnerability, including national nationwide leadership on family violence support. So Pat's really got his hands dirty and engaged directly in engaging in this sort of work and no doubt has confronted some of the challenges that Cynthia set out in terms of how do you get consistency across the customer experience when you've got a, a staff, different staff dealing with different people. But uh, keen to hear your reflections, Pat. Thanks, Simon, and good afternoon all. And it's great to see so many familiar faces uh, online today. Um, I'd also like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands and the waterways on which I'm standing, uh, the people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to any other First Nations people who might be on the call today. I do note, uh, actually, that uh, one of the themes in the draft strategy uh, calls out for improved support for First Nations consumers, and certainly we're on our second reconciliation action plan, a stretch wrapper here at Yarra Valley Water, and it actually has a specific action to ensure our services are culturally appropriate 
um, and tailored uh, to meet First Nations needs. And one of the focuses that we've got inside of that is breaking down, I guess, the institutional fear uh, that does exist in, in those communities. So I, I want to acknowledge the Commission for the work that's done on this draft strategy uh, and taking a step to sort of articulate a plan on, on how it can support um, access for people experiencing vulnerability in our society. And as Cynthia said, you know, we are talking about essential services. So I guess by definition, uh, you know, you need them to live. Um, and so I think it's entirely appropriate for the regulator to lean into this realm uh, as being in the best interest of the community. Uh, if we think of water, um, the United Nations has declared access to safe, affordable and reliable uh, water and sanitation uh, as a fundamental human right. And um, after all, these things underpin human health, uh, the health of the environment uh, and a productive society. Uh, and certainly um, our own commitment to the UN Sustainable Development Goals and, and the intent of leaving no one behind uh, also in, heavily influences the uh, strategic direction uh, of our organisation that's embedded in our 2030 strategy, where inclusion is fundamental. Uh, and we want to ensure that everyone uh, can access our services in the way uh, they need, uh, that we communicate effectively uh, with diverse communities and, of course, involve them in our decision making. And in line with that UN human right, I guess we have a fundamental philosophy that access to our essential services shouldn't be compromised by individual capacity to pay for those services. Uh, and that's backed up uh, by consumer sentiment and by a lot of research over many years that when it comes to our services, uh, recognising and responding to vulnerability is strongly supported by the broader community uh, to the extent of you know, including subsidising support programs through water bills and investing uh, and ensuring that those who need uh, the help actually can access it. Uh, it's also true in our experience that I guess investment in looking after people experiencing vulnerability is good business and also provides a significant social return on investment. So, I mean, our own journey started a long time ago when we thought we were doing okay uh, in supporting people, but once we sort of held a mirror uh, up to ourselves and started to listen uh, and open ourselves up, uh, listen to the experts and people with lived experience, we realised that we had a long way to go. And so over the years, this has caused a real shift uh, in the practices that we've got. Um, and really coming from the front line of our water care people uh, team who deal with uh, day in, day out, uh, the lived experiences of, of our customers. And changing, working right up through the process, uh, the value chain to change the process, the systems, the policies uh, around uh, the support uh, for people having vulnerability. Uh, and what, I've, what I'm noticing in this draft strategy already is that so many of the themes that have been identified by the ESC resonates with, with much of what we've learned. So, I mean, obviously at its core, it's about communication, it's about transparency, it's about organisational culture, it's about being very clear what you stand for, um, and it's about making sure that people know that you're there for, you, for them, that you do care. And that building that confidence so that they can have those conversations with your organisation uh, and it's a safe place for them to do so. And I certainly think uh, the Victorian water sector has been generally pretty effective uh, in assisting people experiencing vulnerability. And a lot of that was amplified uh, during COVID uh, where we came together and really shared all of our practices and put some minimum um, you know, standards in a baseline, if you like, to make sure that we could all you know, uh, help uh, the people in our own communities. Um, and I think this strategy is really along those lines. It's, a, it's, it's about lifting all the boats, um, including other sectors. Um, and it provides us with sort of a common foundation, if you like, and a set of guiding principles for ensuring effective and dignified support for those that need it. And, I mean, obviously being government owned uh, monopolies, our context in water is a little bit different, but I do think that when it comes to issues of vulnerability, you know, competition should be left at the door. And we're huge advocates uh, of collaboration to address systemic issues. So that's why, uh, you know, I think Simon mentioned the Thriving Communities Partnership. We're very keen to support establishing that. It, it's a vehicle for bringing essential services uh, providers together with the welfare sector uh, and other uh, stakeholders uh, with a focus on ensuring that people have access to the services that they need to thrive. For example, water, energy, telecommunications and banking. Um, and related to this mission, a lot of, the, again, of the themes that the uh, ESC has identified, uh, namely um, people uh, need confidence uh, and trust uh, in the system and in the organisation and service providers to actually seek their help, uh, how those organisations identify those who need help uh, and the inconsistency that's currently offered. And to that end, you know, one of the uh, projects that the TCP is working on is the one-stop, one-story hub, and I know a lot of the organisations and people on this call are involved in that. 
Uh, and that's really a central system that we want to build for those that need help. So they only have to ever, ever have to tell their story once uh, to get proactive support from their central service providers. And we do know that most providers do have programs, but it's a, it's a very difficult process to try to access them sometimes, and certainly for people uh, that are experiencing vulnerability. So uh, the idea of that hub um, is a far more dignified uh, and less complicated process than what people actually have to experience now. There's a lot more action required on that front to deliver it, but uh, we're making progress and, and the prize is absolutely huge. Um, so I guess, you know, you know coming together um, and having these collaborations is how we can all make a positive difference. And there's always something we can learn from each other. And I, I was thinking about the work that we did initially uh, in relation to the impact of family violence causing uh, financial hardship and what we've done since and what we have uh, delivered to sort of, I guess, protect and support customers experiencing that. And we found that, you know, utilities bills, and when you when you talk about this to, to people who don't have, um, you know, the exposure to the issue, uh, that they didn't realise how much the utility bill could be used as a weapon and get weaponised uh, in a domestic violence situation. So, you know, we found that, you know, the perpetrators of domestic violence using the bill to either try and locate uh, the victim, uh, exercise more control over their lives, uh, put them into some sort of debt follow-up process and, and those sorts of things. So, you know, we, we actually sat down, we listened to calls and we actually had our board listen to calls from our, from our call centre where our people day to day were, uh, were listening to those issues coming from uh, the victims of family violence. And uh, obviously that led to some very significant shifts in the way we, uh, you know, we supported those people. But then there was a Royal Commission, as you probably all know, into family violence and the ESC was able to pick up on uh, some of the work that we'd done and do a lot of sector-wide engagement, uh, meaning that sort of better practice was socialised and embedded in the water service customer code, which was terrific. And I think in turn for us, you know, it challenged us again to improve our own processes. Um, uh, and, and those of our colleagues in the water sector. And I think no doubt also is influencing, hopefully, um, you know, guidance for other sectors. So just to, in closing, I think um, going to, back to my earlier point about uh, lifting all the boats, um, I do think this draft strategy has really zeroed in on the key issues of vulnerability and, and the provision of essential services. And it's got great potential uh, in helping achieve a, a fairer, uh, more equitable society. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, Pat. Um, I think there's some really important themes there in terms of culture, in terms of collaboration, lifting all boats, uh, the importance of trust. Um, so I think that was a really inter interesting introduction. I'm now going to um, move on to Sarah McNamara. Um, we'll have time for more questions later, but for now I'd like to move on to Sarah, who's the CEO of the Australian Energy Council. The Commission has worked uh, and sometimes had some very healthy debates with the Council over many years. Sarah's been the CEO of the Council for over three years now and is a true advocate of the energy sector. So looking forward to your um, observations. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks very much, Simon, and uh, hello to everyone. I'm very pleased to be here today, and I'd like to start, of course, by echoing the previous speakers and acknowledging and showing respect to the traditional owners on the land on which we're meeting and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. The Australian Energy Council welcomes steps from the Commission and other regulators to seek to improve how it deals with issues relating to vulnerable customers. For those who don't know me, my name is Sarah and I'm Chief Executive of the Australian Energy Council and the AEC represents generators and retailers of gas and electricity across the country. Although of course today we are focused on the work we do as the peak body for energy retailers here in Victoria. Key to the supporting role we play with retailers is assisting energy businesses to evolve their support frameworks to provide customers with fair access to energy. This work involves collaboration with members and regulators to develop industry agreed positions and advocate for those positions in fora like these. As we're all keenly aware, the 2020 pandemic put all of us and our stakeholders and families under enormous pressure. There was one unintended outcome though, uh, and it was a positive one. And that was that the years of work that energy retailers had completed with the ESC here in Victoria on its customer hardship framework uh, really came into its own. And whilst not perfect, the detailed frameworks that were in place already enabled our, enabled our member retailers to do a really good job of supporting their customers during the pandemic. Now we hope that we are through the worst of the pandemic, we are moving into a stage of what we hope will continue to be economic recovery. 
but there is still much work to do to support those in need in our community. So I'm delighted to be here today as a representative of an industry that is keen to work with the ESC and community stakeholders to ensure ongoing support is targeted and proportionate for those most at need. Now, I'm just, my colleague is just going to share a couple of slides uh, with you <coughs> because I did want to take the opportunity uh, to give a bit of a plug for some work the AEC has been doing during 2020, which was quite new for us in that we began to try to communicate directly with customers as opposed to just with policymakers and government media and, and our member businesses. We thought that we could really support the work the ESC and our retail businesses were doing by communicating uh, with customers with a really simple message. And that is, if you're concerned about being able to pay your bill, please pick up the phone and ring your retailer because if we can hold, have, ensure these conversations are held reasonably early, then customers can get the help that they need, which may mitigate against further distress. <clears throat> Our work here is not done, however, and we expect to continue to run this campaign through the year. <coughs> Excuse me. Noting particularly that some of the additional hardship um, may, be, may be experienced as JobKeeper and JobSeeker um, begin to roll off and we see those impacts in the community. So in short, energy retailers and their peak body, the AEC, are here to help. But while we support the really good intentions of the ESC in developing this strategy, we are concerned that to date there has been insufficient genuine collaboration with industry. And although we were aware that the ESC was working on this strategy and were naturally not invited to any of the seven community sector roundtables, I also note that we weren't included on the stakeholder reference group or the deliberative community panel. Now these detailed and dedicated community engagements are really commendable and I'm sure there were lots of extremely interesting and useful discussions that have resulted in the drafting of the strategy we have before us. But a broader industry voice in that room could only have been helpful as the strategy was in its draft stage. And our experience working uh, as the voice for energy retailers in public forums is that too often governments, regulators and the community sector are not entirely aware of the broad support and access frameworks that retailers are operating. Nor is there always good awareness of what is possible versus which measures will only create additional complexity without accompanying benefits for vulnerable customers. So the AEC would like to see improved collaboration to enable a genuine two-way consultation on key issues such as this at the start of the project. Public forums increase visibility and we're very pleased to be participating today. But these forums have uh, in, in their nature fairly limited open engagement. So it should be a method of hearing views rather than the primary method of speaking with industry. We believe that genuine co-design with industry regulators and the consumer sector only enriches the output and should be front and center of this strategy. Hearing only voices without direct oversight of the internal operations of these industries also lessens the ability of the strategy to genuinely deliver benefits to Victorian customers in need. Similarly, governments also hold key levers when it comes to implementing measures to support vulnerable customers. While pressure should be placed on regulators' businesses to do better, such as my member retailers, this same pressure also needs to apply to governments who themselves hold key economic levers to deliver fairness. Processes must be built on the government side in accordance with these principles too. And the ESC as an independent regulator should call out when things go wrong. Now, recent examples of things unfortunately going very wrong include significant delays in, pro in government processing utility relief grant applications and opt-in hurdles being placed on the recently implemented Victorian power saving, saving bonus, which has dramatically limited its uptake. And I think that goals three, four and five of the draft strategy are directly relevant here. An additional point I wanna raise here today is the need for regulated businesses to be given the space and encouraged to innovate and deliver more for their customers. Regulators and businesses have a shared incentive when it comes to assisting vulnerable customers. And the better a business does to support the specific needs of their customers, 
the lower the long-term costs. Now the payment difficulties framework makes it clear that the earlier a customer can be supported, the less likely they will need uh, comprehensive and therefore expensive support. So with these shared incentives in mind, we urge the ESC to genuinely consider how its intervention in good business practices impacts the customers they are intending to support. Highly prescriptive processes like the payment difficulties framework may increase the protections offered by some retailers, but we need to make sure they don't necessarily reduce the protections offered by others and stifle that innovation. An alternative response seen is to seek to regulate when retailers go over and above the minimum, rather than encourage retailers to strive to do better. The AEC will shortly release a best practice resource for retailers and other stakeholders to utilise when developing and enhancing its own practices. This resource uses a uh, light on the hill approach rather than minimum standards regulation as a means of encouraging better outcomes for energy consumers. It focuses on increasing access, ease of interaction and building trust. Finally, I just want to raise one important final point any changes to the regulatory framework to increase protections and support to vulnerable customers are important, but we must be cognizant that they will inevitably increase costs on regulated businesses. And those businesses are finding their margin squeeze and costs increasing in the current environment too, both because of market pressures and additional, additional regulatory burdens. So it is critical that costs are considered and mitigated to the extent possible and that alternative approaches are considered where it is efficient to keep these costs off energy bills themselves. This includes, for example, that all steps are taken to ensure the tax and transfer system is adequately targeted to minimise the impact on bills of low and income and vulnerable households. Ultimately, collaboration, targeted supports and innovation will continue to deliver improving outcomes for Victorian consumers in need. The AEC looks forward to undertaking that journey and we encourage the ESC to work with us as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Look, fantastic to hear the themes coming through there. I think we're very keen to improve the collaboration as we move from possible initiatives to the next phase, which would be developing the specifics of how we might design any interventions that we might do. Um, I really was pleased that light on the hill approach, I think that's a, a great terminology and we're certainly uh, keen to promote um, collaborative behaviours as, as Pat was outlining as well. So um, some really important messages there. And Yes, I think the issue about being mindful of the costs, I mean, what we're looking for from all the stakeholders is feedback on the possible initiatives. Are they going to make a difference? And are they feasible? And part of feasibility will obviously having a careful understanding of um, whatever costs any initiative might impose, because um, ultimately uh, they fall on consumers at the end of the day, as well as businesses as they pass from businesses. So thank you very much for those observations. I'm sure we'll have a, uh, a good discussion, both the rest of this discussion today and um, as we move through to the uh, sector specific workshops and to finalising the strategy. Um, and uh, I'm just going to move now uh, to our last speaker, which is last but not least is Gerard Brody before we go into our plenary discussion. Our last speaker is Gerard Brody, who's the uh, CEO of the Consumer Action Law Centre. Many of you probably know Gerard already. He's taken part in a number of our events in the past and has provided um, advice to this sector for a number of years, uh, including being on TV a bit, I think, a few times lately, Gerard. So looking forward to your observations uh, on this important topic. Well, thanks, Simon, and thanks for the invitation um, to speak to everyone today. It's a, it's a really great pleasure. I would also like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands and waterways um, we're, we're, we're talking today on uh, and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that um, these countries were never ceded um, and, and mention also the important process that this state is going through with um, treaty making at the moment. Um, I'd like to congratulate the um, Essential Service Commission on, on publishing its draft strategy. I'm, I'm really aware that it's taken a, um, a lot of thinking and, engage, and, and a lot of engagement by many at the Commission. 
Um, as Kate said in, in her forward to the draft decision, this sort of strategy isn't something that has been typically employed by an economic regulator. And I think that's significant. I'd go further and say it's something that hasn't been um, typically employed by any regulator in Australia. Um, so perhaps a nationwide first. Um, I am aware that there are other uh, regulators in the room today. So I just encourage you all to be looking closely at EEC's work and reflecting on how you are ensuring the people, um, all people in the markets you're regulating are being considered and how you're also delivering on principles like inclusivity and fairness. Um, the draft strategy uh, is very interesting. It includes um, quite a bit of content about definitions and terminology, and I think that's important. I'm aware that these issues were raised in the stakeholder reference group and the deliberative community panel. Um, I do think it's important that the draft guide defines vulnerability. Um, I, I think I spoke previously about these issues um, back at the um, 2019 National Consumer Congress um, and suggested um, that, that we really must, in any sort of def definition exercise, uh, be recognising that nearly anyone can become vulnerable. Um, it's vulnerability is not an inherent uh, quality or characteristic of a person, but an experience um, caused by barriers to access. Um, uh, at that time, I referred to the a definition that was developed um, following a large European Union study, and it covered uh, people who are at higher risk um, of experiencing negative outcomes in a market, having limited or less ability to maximise their own well-being, having difficulty in obtaining or assimilating information, being less able to buy, choose or access suitable products, or are more susceptible to marketing practices. And I think the ESC's proposed definition in its draft strategy with, with its focus on barriers to accessing essential services is similar, and I think that's really welcome. Um, it's good to see also the draft strategy recognises that labelling people as vulnerable is not that helpful. Um, when we communicate with the public, I think it's really important to recognise there's a real diversity of experience out there. Um, and so we really need to be using inclusive and open language rather than labelling people. Um, so I think that, you know, the, the, the title of, of the strategy as, as uh, getting to fair and, and terms like fairness and accessibility and inclusion um, are really the, the things that need to be focused on when we're communicating to the public, both uh, the regulator, um, but also the regulated industries um, and, uh, you know, community organisations as well. The themes um, identified in the draft strategy are quite broad and I'm not going to comment on them all. Um, there is a focus on, on good communication, good information and engagement. I just thought I'd say, I think this is really important, but I also think that regulators should not forget that um, focusing on consumer information can too often overlook better regulatory interventions. Um, for those that haven't seen it, it's worth looking back at um, the report from uh, the Australian Securities Investments Commission, ASIC, in, in 2019 on consumer information. Um, that report's really helpful. It explains why disclosures and warnings can backfire. Um, it actually can lead to, to um, consumer harm. We can say, oh, we've got a warning there, but if people can't sort of uh, uh, understand the, the warning, then, you know, the harm, you know, occurs and, it, and it's sort of considered their fault. Um, and so I think that, that consuming information is not going to be the sole um, solution here. Um, there needs to be a, a greater focus um, in any strategy on vulnerability on product and service design. Um, the principle, principles of inclusive design are really essential. That is des designing products, services, or consumer experiences so that they're accessible to and usable by as many people as possible. I thought I'd also make just a couple of points for regulated businesses. Um, I'd really encourage them to be looking at this draft strategy as an opportunity um, and, and to think about um, how to implement their own strategies to respond to consumer vulnerability. So I was really pleased to hear at some of the things from, from Pat and Sarah just now. Some businesses, of course, are, are doing this already. Um, I've actually been impressed recently by uh, the work um, via the energy charter of a number of the energy retailers and distributors working together through a knock before you disconnect 
trial, which this involved uh, field crews contacting customers um, rather than immediately disconnecting them for overdue gas bills. Um, and the pilot showed that 80% of disconnections were cancelled um, and customers stayed connected. Um, so that's a really good example of, of, of being innovative and, and, and developing systems and policies and processes that respond to vulnerability and the way people actually behave. Another example um, I'm aware of from the UK has involved with um, some of the industry peak bodies in the finance sector developing really great training programs to build understanding and share best practice about responding to consumer vulnerability. For those that haven't seen it, Google the Vulnerability Academy. Um, it's been also involves the Money Advice Trust in the UK and there's some great podcasts there as well. Finally, I just wanted to comment on the focus in the ESC's draft strategy, strategy about um, listening to consumers. This is, this is really essential. Um, and I'd encourage the regulator and businesses uh, to develop um, strategies to ensure ongoing engagement directly with those people that have or are experiencing vulnerability. I think this really needs to go beyond speaking to representatives like me. <laughs> um, it also needs to go further than, you know, traditional business practices like market research that is used to identify customer insights. Um, I think this sort of work really needs to consider the importance of lived experience and immersive engagement. Um, an example from our work is at Consumer Action has been um, the Day in the Life program, which we've run with Financial Counselling Australia over the last few years. And in fact, all of the um, ESE commissioners, I think, now have participated uh, in the program, which involves spending some time listening to calls to the National Debt Helpline and understanding the work of financial counsellors. Um, I think this sort of activity um, gives a real depth and richness of insights by actually hearing about someone's financial stress, the story uh, that they turn up with. Um, and that these are people that have, have taken action um, to improve their situation by calling a financial counsellor. Um, and that's not to be underestimated. And I think that when people have experience their day in the life, they get um, real uh, and different insights and, and motivations than they had prior. So I'd really encourage the commission to, um, to build this type of immersive engagement more in its strategy. Um, for example, the theme in the draft strategy about building partnership with First Nations communities in order to address the very high levels of energy disconnections um, for, for those communities is, is really welcome. But I'd also encourage the Commission to consider whether immersive engagement is part of that, really listening and understanding the experience of those who have been disconnected, uh, working with Aboriginal community controlled organisations um, to build ongoing engagement. We can all be shocked as I am when I read the statistics which show that one in 10 First Nations consumers were facing immediate disconnection by their energy retailer in 2019-20. One in 10, it's, it's, um, it's shocking. But I suspect actually listening um, to the lived experience of this is likely to drive even more action. Um, so I will leave it there. Thank you very much. Look, thank you, Jared. You raised lots of interesting points there, and I know I certainly found my involvement in the community panel the 30, with the 37 Victorians from across the, the state a fascinating experience to really hear it direct from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Uh, so that was a fantastic experience. Pat, I wonder if I could, now we're opening up the panel to, to questions and uh, for a bit of a comment across the, the our three panellists. Pat, I wonder if I could throw it to you, um, the point that Jared made about immersive engagement, about um, engaging directly with consumers. I wonder if you could speak a, a little bit about your experience with make operationalising that. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, again, the leadership has come from the front line within our business, We're bringing, first of all, bringing uh, I guess, to our attention, you know, what's occurring out there. Uh, and they are dealing uh, with people with experience day in, day out, um, and then influencing it back up uh, into the business, you know, positive changes, I guess. But also things like citizens' juries that we've done and, you know, just speaking to people and just getting out. I think, you know, um, being part of the community um, and, you know, sort of uh, connecting as much as we can. I think about... You know, even the work that we've been doing on, um, you know, um, reconciliation, uh, you know, what I've learned in the last two or three years in talking 
uh, to people compared to what I thought I knew. Um, it's just a complete shift in, in the way I view the world. And, and it's the truth telling stuff. Um, and it's no different it, whether it's indigenous issues or people experiencing family violence or gender or, or in any of those issues. It's, it's talking to people and trying to sort of, you know, uh, hear their stories and, uh, and bring those stories to life and share those stories. And, and that, I think that's how we, how we learn. And as I said, when we, when we uh, you know, our water care team brought those calls to the executive team and said, we think you should hear some of the calls that we're, you know, we're hearing that with domestic violence situations, you know, that, that was a massive, um, uh, that, it caused a massive shift in the way we were looking at it. We all, we all felt strongly about the issue, but it was when we actually heard a phone call uh, of someone going through that in the middle of the call. I mean, you know, th those things are really impactful. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Um, Sarah, I wonder if I could throw to you now, what do you think are the biggest opportunities and potentially challenges? I mean, obviously you've raised the, the critical issue of us working collaboratively as we move to, to actually operationalize initiatives, but what do you think are the biggest opportunities and challenges in in moving to finalise this sort of program of work? I think from my perspective, and I suppose my bias comes from the work, work that I do with retailers generally, is to make sure whatever we do doesn't just look like it's going to deliver a better outcome for consumers. That Because actually what's going to be a good outcome for consumers is usually a good outcome for retailers as well, because they're happier that they're able to engage and help their consumers and the customers who are experiencing hardship or vulnerability or whatever it is are getting that support that they need. But quite often um, in energy regulation here and in other jurisdictions, things that uh, look like they will do good uh, either fail because they are too complex or too expensive or just in practice don't have the impact that we were hoping they would have. So my real challenge, I think, is to, through our advocacy, help work with the ESC and the community sector to make sure we're doing really sort of good sort of uh, cost benefit analyses of the kind of measures that we're considering. Um, and that cost question is really important because um, retailers do need to minimise the cost and minimise the complexity for consumers at the other end as well. We think that's very important. Fantastic. Uh, and one of the things I reflected on in the last year is how much we can learn from businesses that do things well and translate that more broadly. I know, Pat, in your sector, uh, the water sector, the um, water retailers have been helping their consumers fill in the ERGS forms, the utility relief grant forms, which as Sarah noted are not the simplest and it's not the smoothest process yet. But I think the experience in the water sector, you'd found that that had been very beneficial in terms of getting helping consumers uh, get the assistance they need and also also pay their water bills, which is good for the businesses. Yeah, I think, you know, the ERGs are, you know, uh, something that can be of real value, but a, a very inefficient process. And I mean, I think we've managed to shift that during COVID as well. And again, you know, COVID sort of shone a light on where some of the weaknesses in the system are. Uh, but you're dead right. I mean, if you can do a concierge service and help people through that process um, and simplify it as well for them, um, then they, they're accessing the support that's actually there. And I think that's one of the key points in all of this is that there is support available, but to actually access it uh, and get it um, is hard. Um, and so how we, how we uh, you know, improve the efficiency of those systems is, is another crucial part of this conversation. Yeah, and I, I think that's uh, really important. And Sarah, you made the point earlier that we need to advocate strongly with our government partners to try and improve their performance. And I can tell you that uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, or the, the, the then DHS, um, heard that message very loudly in a number of the forums that we had with the community sector, uh, where they were there in a listening mode. So um, that's a, cr a critical issue. Um, so, Jared, you mentioned the success of the Day in the Life uh, program and the immersive engagement. Are there other ways in which you think we can practically engage the community uh, sector more in the sort of inclusive design? Yeah, I think that those, I mean, immersive engagement is a broad term, so there are lots of different ways to do it. And I'm not saying that I, I know all, all the different ways. There'll be many people in this room that have got great ideas about how to make that happen. I mean, I've seen, um, 
uh, you know, I, I understand that many of the businesses do this directly themselves, making sure that they, um, uh, you know, Pat talked about listening in on, on calls from people who might have been experiencing family violence to really understand what the impact was. Um, uh, so there are things businesses can do themselves. Um, in terms of the commission, I think that, um, you know, it's just going to create, um, uh, I guess what I'm really saying, it's more of a state of mind to be open to a, trialing new ways of doing things, uh, to be open about recognising that you may have biases um, in, in, in uh, a certain structure of consultation um, that's not going to be conducive with getting the type of feedback you've got and, and innovating um, as you go and really listening to the community. They will also have suggestions about how best um, to provide to provide input and feedback. Um, look, there are other things that can be done to be more proactive. Um, you know, I'm aware of uh, some of our colleague organisations like Good Shepherd have run immersion programs for, for bankers by taking them out into the front payday lending stores and seeing what they're like. Um, so there are different ways in which um, uh, you can you can do this. I thought just um, I, I might just say something um, picking up on something Sarah said about um, costs and benefits of this work. You know, there, there will be costs um, to the regulator, to the industry, um, to better respond to vulnerability. But I think we've also got to try and focus on the benefits. Um, you know, that having more appropriate consumer transactions, people making more informed decisions um, about the products they need. Um, greater reductions in financial difficulty during to, to, to you know, um, people getting on the right deal, the right product to begin with. Um, you know, if it's implemented correctly, we'll re have reductions in, in psychological stress experienced by people because they'll receive more timely help and support. And there'll actually be consumer time savings, even better quality interactions, no having to chase, your, chase around the business, call them five times. Um, you know, avoidance of complaint and redress procedures. And that, that's a, a saving to industry as well. So I just encourage us to also look at the benefit side of the equation when we're looking at costs and benefits. Can, can I jump in there? Um, Absolutely, go Pat. We've done a, a fair bit of work and I think it's all been socialised, but you know, there is a business case with, associated with this, a positive business case, you know, and um, uh, chasing, chasing debt that's not going to be paid doesn't make any business sense um, and you know so you know when, when you can you know provide a, a helping hand not a handout and help someone get back on their feet the loyalty to the organization uh, and those sorts of things you know um, uh, is part of the return so I, I do think if you look at these things in a holistic sort of economic perspective you will actually see a different see it through a different lens as well. Jared, I'd um, just like to note, I mean, while we're focused on water and energy, understandably, the scope of this strategy is broader than those sectors and local government is one of the other areas where we've got a, a degree of responsibility as well as transport. I wonder if you could comment on um, your observations on local government. We've had someone in the chat su suggesting that some better practice initiatives um, from the energy and the water sector could be applied to local government. I wonder if you've had any exposure to that in your work. Yeah, um, I, I think that that is a, a really good point to make. Um, and one thing I would say is we've had um, resourced consumer advocacy at different points around energy and water, but less so um, in resourcing sort of engagement on local government issues. Um, so I just point that out as something that might um, contribute to the different approaches taking. Um, uh, I mean, uh, our colleagues um, through Financial Council of Victoria have done a lot of work looking at um, some of the hardship policies that local councils have and trying to encourage improvement uh, there. I mean, a number of years ago, I remember working on, on this issue a little bit and, and being shocked that um, local councils were the, the number one uh, users of, of magistrates court debt recovery uh, mechanisms for unpaid um, rates. Um, and you think you step back and think about that, and rates is is secured against the property. Um, why do they why are they spending um, lawyers and court money and wasting court resources to recover um, that sort of money? Surely there is a better way of of doing it. Um, I think some um, local councils have really reviewed uh, the way in which they collect rates. Um, for example, use of things like Centerpay. Um, Centerpay is the fortnightly bill paying service that. Uh, energy and water retailers know and, and are used to, but it's not widely used 
in local governments. I think a couple of them use centre pay, but it's not widely used. Um, having you know requirements around that could actually be a, a real important way to help people uh, maintain payments on on their rates, particularly across you know regional Victoria, where we know there's probably more. Um, homeowners that are, you know, pensioners and so forth that are in vulnerable circumstances, um, and and that sort of support can can really make a difference. Fantastic. No, thank you for that observation, Pat. I wonder if I could jump to you again, just on the your comments about dealing with uh, supporting First Nations people. If you've got any uh, thoughts on how you can effectively uh, work most closely with that part of the community. Well, I think it's about um, obviously being engagement and um, and being really listening in a powerful way. Uh, I talked about truth telling before. Um, you know, I think we've all a lot, a lot of the people on the call we would have experienced a, a different view of the world when we learned history uh, when we went to school. Hopefully, that's changing now. I mean, we had, and it's about bringing those stories to life as well with all the people that you meet. So, I'll, I'll give you an example. You know, I used to talk about the water sector. We, you know, we started in 1893 with the establishment of the Porter Works and we were cleaning up Melbourne and public health was our goal. But then when I realised, you know, recently we were sort of, you know, putting a new sewage system in at Donvale and we, we dug up over 2,000 Indigenous artefacts that have been there for thousands and thousands of years. People have been looking after the country and the waterways for a very long time. Uh, and, you know, so it, it's about that connection. It's about appreciating that. Um, it's about seeking good good advice. I'm a, we're really fortunate at Yarra Valley Water. We have two Indigenous board members who have been great mentors for us. And it's a really, you know, they're, they're, it's about being curious, I think, too, and, and asking questions um, and, and, and seeking that that understanding. And, and listening to the stories about, you know, things like stolen generations and so forth. And, uh, you know, um, it's difficult. We, we don't live in their shoes, uh, but you know we have to have to appreciate their stories, and uh, uh, and that's how we get breakthroughs. Um, we recognise that there's a breakdown um, in society, and we we move forward together in a respectful way. So you really do have to be you know open and, and do the cultural awareness training and all those sorts of things. That, that's my view. Okay, no, Simon, can yes. I just Come say on, in yes. relation to what? What Pat was just saying, and I really like what you're saying, Pat. I'm a financial counsellor and I work at the Aboriginal Advancement League on a Monday. Yesterday I was sitting with women who were stolen, have been stolen when they were young, and one of them I only found out yesterday, her, her brother was, hung, you know, was found hanged in a jail in Western Australia quite a while ago. These are people who struggle with their gas and electricity payments I mean, I think it's great we connect with them and everything, but I really think we need to do something practical like not, and Sarah, I hope you think this is this is good because I know you're concerned about, about um, money and payment difficult protection stifling initiatives. Um, I think that's what you said, but um, I think we need to really do something practical like not letting an Indigenous person get disconnected unless when we put something further in with them because I know from the experience I've had with people being disconnected in the last few months that what has made a difference is the workers who go out to the families, like who maybe do their shopping or, and that's why I said particularly elders, that they're the people who've got the connections with them. So instead of someone like this woman was being disconnected for six days, not having any electricity and having to keep her medications in the fridge so they were kept at the chemist, instead of that happening, she shouldn't have been disconnected um, unless, and it has to be um, in or written, written down that you can't be disconnected unless... You do this, this and this. And I think we owe that. Like you said, Pat, you know, their land and you found all the artefacts over there and they've been there. I think we owe them. We do owe them this. And I I really hope, I really hope we can do something about it this year. Anyway, thank you for listening to me. Thanks, Carmel. I think that's a really important point. One of the things I think we found through our consultation, Carmel, was 
uh, the important role of intermediaries, trusted intermediaries, that often mm -hmm. uh, people are receiving these letters and uh, or reminder notices and whatever and not knowing how to deal with them. And uh, financial counsellors and others can be really valuable intermediaries between the person who's experiencing vulnerability and the um, retailer or water business or local government they're dealing with. So I think that raises a really important point. Sarah, did you want to respond to that at all? Oh, look, I absolutely support Carmel's concerns. And I think one of the challenges for the industry is that there are circumstances where disconnection, which as we know is a very heavily regulated and controlled area, is used as an option of absolute last resort. And no one likes to do it. Um, it is sometimes um, a tool that's used to get the customer to engage. And I think perhaps we need, we could benefit from some more consideration of how that's considered through uh, the lens of First Nations people. Um, because retailers often aren't aware of the ethnicity of people that they're speaking to. Uh, and they have lots of privacy issues around the sorts of questions they can ask and the sorts of personal information they can obtain from customers. Um, but equally, as Simon said, what they are really dependent on because they are not, um, they, they are not wise in, in every aspect of a, a customer's situation. What they often really utilise well, I think, is those intermediary people and people such as yourself, Carmel, who offer support and have a, an even more detailed and close understanding of the challenges that that particular household might be experiencing. Yep, that's good, Sarah. But in this case, the woman was disconnected for six days, like something needed to happen. I mean, I think financial counsellors do great work, but I think something needs to happen. So for all the people out there who don't go to financial counsel, for all the Indigenous people who are sitting somewhere or other, and often, like two of the mothers who are with yesterday, they went to the funerals of their 40-year-old 40, 40 um in their 40s um, sons-in-law in the last couple of weeks. Like there's, there's too much tragedy in there and hardness in their lives. So that's why I really want something in, like you can find out if someone's an Indigenous person by saying, are you of, you know, do you identify with being Aboriginal? I mean, we put that in, but then we need to do other things. And that's what I really like us all to, to meet about. Yeah. So, Carmel, um, one of the initiatives that we proposed um, in the in the strategy is reviewing the payment difficulties framework, and I think the issue you've raised will be a really critical uh, element as we work through with that. Uh, just now, I'd like to call on Satesh Bajani, uh, one, of, one of my fellow commissioners. You want to make an observation, Satesh? Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you for that. And uh, just fascinating to listen to this, and thank you all for your participation. But what... Uh, Carmel has just been raising has really struck a chord for me in terms of some of the comments we were hearing from the various panels through the, throughout last year. And I just wanted to ask Sarah, whether in terms of collaborating with yourself and the energy sector industry, Sarah, one of the suggestions that was made was the importance of Indigenous liaison officers, and whether you think that uh, your members might be open to a suggestion of that kind to deal with these sorts of issues. Well, I don't see why we wouldn't be open to having a discussion about the suggestions, Satesh. I mean, we'd want to have a look at what retailers are doing already in the space and the extent to which we can build on that in a positive way um, rather than duplicate or replicate um, some engagement that may already be going on. I mean, every business has its own, um, not quite bespoke approach, but its own way of connecting with communities that, it's re that it really identifies as needing support particularly. Um, so we wouldn't want to push that to one side. We want, we'd want to use the knowledge that's there and enhance it where we can and where it makes good common sense to do so. Yeah, no, that's great to hear. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. I'm sure the team and even the commissioners would be great, uh, delighted to engage with you on that issue to see if we can try and facilitate some meaningful outcomes in that sense. Thank you. Thanks, Satesh. I think that answers a question. One of the questions we um, that appeared in the chat was wondering why the recommendation um, about collaborating with First Nations was limited to water and not more broadly to energy and other sectors. And, and clearly there's an appetite for looking at how we can work more closely with First Nations communities 
um, in all the sectors that we have some responsibility with. I thought uh, there's a couple of interesting question, comments about Jared from Jared and Pat about the link to other sectors. I know there's people from the banking sector who are on this uh, on this on this uh, web who've joined this webinar and the telecommunications sector and clearly all of these sectors uh, people who are experiencing vulnerability don't just experience it in their water they experience it in all aspects of their life and Jared I wondered if you had any insights on how we can get a more joined up um, approach. Yeah, there is a real opportunity, I think, amongst the regulators um, to, to be sharing um, experiences and amongst the sectors to be sharing experiences. Simon, I know that you lead a, a, a regulators forum, I think. Um, and I think that sharing what you're doing there and encouraging other regulators to consider how they can um, also develop similar strategies to ensure that in the markets they look after, um, you know, people, uh, uh, you know, the, the barriers to access and, and ensuring of uh, 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 taken down and, and ensuring inclusive services is maintained. I think that's a key way. And I guess that, um, you know, as part of what you're suggesting here by, um, you know, the, the focus on listening to customers, I mean, listening to their full experience. Um, you're right, they're not just an energy bill um, or, or an energy debt. Um, they are a person um, with um, a, a range of life experiences um, and being aware about, um, you know, ways to support that person more broadly. So things like referral pathways are, are really important. Um, and it's something that we, we've worked a lot on with some sectors about, you know, when to make appropriate referrals to, to financial counsellors, for example, um, when people do have multiple debts or multiple concerns, it's a really important time to be making um, those referrals. Whereas if it's, it is just the energy bill that they're, they're, they're struggling with, um, then, you know, it's important that the, the, the energy business does um, support that person directly under, within their existing obligations. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that listening to customers um, means that really understanding their, their full spectrum of, of their lives. I think that's really important. Thank you. And I saw in the chat, there's a comment asking if we'd been in touch with Centrelink um, or Aboriginal Housing, um, have been involved in discussions for the strategy. Uh, I don't think we've been in touch with either of those organisations to date, but there's some really good observations there about thinking about how applying concessions to all your utilities when rentals are set up. So that's the sort of ideas we're hoping to, to, to get through the development from this phase as a draft and draft strategy to uh, to finalising it. Um, Chiara, you're on the call, I think. I wonder, just trying to think if I, I can see. Am, Simon, uh, I have no, I have no internet because it's a bit stormy, so I've got no camera, but you can hear my voice from the deep uh, your, depths. Your voice without your uh, without the video will be fine. I wonder if you could talk about the work that um, Thriving Communities has been doing on this sort of cross-sector challenge. Yeah, look, I think part of what we're... Um, what we're all about is around the opportunities across different sectors and the hub that Pat mentioned earlier, you know, we've got CBA and AGL and Sydney Water and Yarra Valley Water and um, Transurban all involved from a, from a corporate sector. We've also got a whole range of different community orgs involved. And really we see it as a bit of a Trojan horse, Simon, because what we're looking for is better practice across all industries. You know, what we see for people experiencing any type of of harm or vulnerability or those moments in life is that they've got a million different, you know, things that they have to do with a million different organisations, different criteria, different requirements. What we need to do is create more of an aligned response so that the humans, which should be at the centre of it all, don't have to kind of go through the myriad of mazes of things to, to prove their I guess they're right to access what they should already be eligible to access. So, you know, I think part of the opportunity is everyone's doing different things across different sectors. How do we all learn from each other? And I think that the, the, what, what the ESC have been doing in, in the work that you've been doing and the way you've been doing it is really exemplary. Um, I think it is going to be a space that other industries can learn from as well. And that's what we want. We don't want to create 45 different versions of you know, what does better practice look like? We wanna try and create one space where we're all learning from each other. And, and I think this is really, you know, really grounding work to do that too. Fantastic. Look, thank you, Kara. We really appreciate uh, the involvement we've had with your work as well. So at this point, we've had a couple of interesting, really interesting suggestions in the chat. One about using 
um, if we're breaking brochures and, and other materials for Aboriginal communities that including Aboriginal artwork can be a way to uh, make it more inclusive. That's a great suggestion. And we're really looking forward to getting more suggestions as we go through the, this consultation phase. Um, at this stage, I think I'd like to hand over to Kate uh, to wrap up for today. Thanks um, very much, Simon. I've been listening to all that with utmost interest and uh, a bit sorry to wrap up what was a fantastic discussion on both the draft strategy, um, but also the experiences of consumers more broadly and what this means for businesses as well. So um, today has been a really great opportunity to hear from some of our key industry speakers. So thank you for your time and reflections. I think Cynthia had to come and, come and go, but to Cynthia, to Pat, to Sarah and Gerard, and to also understand your questions from the floor about the draft strategy and what this means for supporting consumers to, to access essential services uh, and the sectors that are involved. So how do we solve some of these key issues together? I'm just thinking about this is not, not about us as a commission operating in a silo. Uh, this will be a very collaborative process that aims to reduce those barriers for access to essential services. You know, front of mind for me is there needs to be practical and effective solutions and those will only be achieved together. So I think we're all in the room uh, seeking to achieve the same positive outcomes for consumers. Um, so looking forward to working with you uh, on that. It's really been heartening for me to hear the themes raised today. Some of the pivotal ones I've, I've heard, um, trust, collaboration, communication, uh, inclusive design, culture, support, and, and key to the success of any initiatives under this draft strategy is, is input from our regulated and administrative se sectors, the community sector, government partners, and, and other regulators in the room. So. Uh, just from a business perspective, thank you, Pat, for sharing your journey in, in water and your interest in stretching uh, yourself further through your business. Uh, thank you also, Sarah, for your acknowledgement and interest in, in the energy sector to continuing to work together. I know you've done a lot over the, uh, uh, in terms of social media, I've seen you on social media a lot, trying to get the word out about, um, you know, the assistance that is there for energy customers uh, and trying to get that engagement. So it's fantastic to see. So I'm looking forward to building upon all of that with you as we move forward. Um, so having identified the problems to date, we're absolutely invested in working with you uh, and your businesses, and in fact, all the other businesses across our regulator sectors, to really ensure that customers are, are supported, initiatives are practical, and as you say, innovation is not stifled. We always want those opportunities for businesses to, to go outside, uh, think about things outside the square and see where they can excel uh, to support customers. So we genuinely uh, look forward to, to working with you all. Um, can I encourage everyone uh, on the call to read the draft strategy? Uh, if you're keen, uh, please provide us with some further feedback. Um, our period for feedback closes on the 6th of June. So I think we've got about six, six weeks or so, or five weeks. And we're planning on releasing the final strategy uh, midway through this year. Uh, really excited to embark on this and have a lot of conversations uh, as we move forward in the coming weeks. So as I mentioned at the start, I think we might have got through all of the questions, but certainly if we didn't get to um, any burning questions that you had during the session today or you didn't feel like you wanted to put your hand up or put a question in the chat, um, please feel free to reach out to the team. Uh, Alex, uh, Lucy, I'm not sure how people get in contact with you, but maybe you could put something on the, on the chat. Um, and, and we'll obviously try to respond via a wrap-up email, I think, that's going out in the next few days just to make sure we can connect with you. Uh, in the coming weeks, we'll also be holding uh, a workshop with each of our regulated sectors. So please look out for an invite uh, or reach out to the team here at the Commission, as I said. Uh, on that note, um, thank you again to all our speakers for taking the time, everyone else for um, attending and participating, and my fellow Commissioner Simon, thank you very much for facilitating um, the panel discussion. Uh, glad I didn't have any more IT issues uh, at the end of the call. Uh, sorry again for the day at, this, at the start, but it keeps everyone on our toes in this new virtual world as we go forward. So thank you, everyone. Um, take care. Look forward to hearing from you. And um, thanks again.